morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us for Cocktails and Politics, a conversation with Catherine Gale. We're so happy to have you this evening. My name is Denisha Snell. I'm the program director here at American Public Square. I'd like to start by thanking everyone who made this program possible, including my fellow APS staffers, our committees that work with us at APS, and our American Public Square volunteers. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank tonight's sponsor, Mike's Wine and Spirits. Um, speaking of Mike's Wine and Spirits, our featured drink for this evening is the Blackberry Ballot, which I think I see each of a lot of you are, are sipping on. And for those of you who are live streaming, we'll make sure we get that recipe up for you so you can try one at home yourself. So as always, during American Public Square programming, we welcome questions from the audience. Um, for those of you watching on live stream, what we're gonna have you do is place your question in the comment box. Now, for those of you who are here, we're gonna do it a little different this evening. Normally, you hold up a card if you have a question, but this evening, hold up your hand, we'll bring the mic to you, and you'll actually get the chance to verbalize your question to our panelists this evening. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand this over to our moderator for this evening, Greg Orman. Thank you. Thanks, Denisha. Uh, welcome to everybody who's here tonight. I think this is one of the first events, if not the first event we've had back, uh, I don't want to say post-pandemic, but uh, during the pandemic. So it's nice to see so many people in person. Uh, it, it really only makes sense that we would have a liquor store sponsor an event called Cocktails and Politics, doesn't it? Um, a, a big welcome to my friend, Catherine Gale. Uh, Catherine uh, is going to tell you a little bit about her background, but just, just for the f sake of full disclosure, Catherine and I have known each other, I think, going on seven years now. And, and in fact, uh, I am on the board of, of Catherine's company, or company business, what, what do we call it? Nonprofit. Not for profit. Nonprofit, the Institute for Political Innovation. So normally Alan Katz would be sitting here. He asked me to fill in because he wasn't able to be here. Uh, and I'm so uh, happy to have uh, my good friend, Catherine Gale, here with us tonight. Uh, uh, but I'm so happy to be here with you, Greg, but also with all of you. It's just thrilling to be in a room with real people <laughs> and drinks. Pretty good. <laughs> So um, why don't we just kick this off? I'm going to ask Catherine a handful of questions, and then I'll open it up and take some questions from the audience, and then maybe circle back and ask some more questions myself. But first, Catherine, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So I grew up in Wisconsin, uh, what was then country, farm country, and is now really a suburb. And that's where I spent most of my life. But my career has been in... Yeah, Catherine, can you hold the mic a little closer? Yes, I can. Okay, there we go. All right, I'll start over. I still grew up in Wisconsin, um, and, and it was a small town, now a suburb. Uh, I've spent my career mostly in business, but had some very interesting opportunities to serve in the public sector. I worked for Mayor Richard M. Daley in Chicago. I worked for the Chicago Public Schools. And I also had the pleasure of serving on a board in the Obama administration in a Senate-confirmed position. So I've been able to see uh, politics from the inside while spending most of my career in business, which is really the nexus uh, that brings me to the work I do today. In any case, I, the last 10 years of my career uh, in business, I ran a food manufacturing company in Wisconsin where we did make cheese, very appropriately. and. I, uh, that was about a $250 million company, 350 employees, highly automated. I sold that company, which I loved, but I sold it in 2015 in part so I could really focus on this work of political innovation. And that's what brings me uh, here today. And uh, by the way, normally I would stop there, but I have to say that Growing up in Wisconsin, there's only one other place where I spend significant time, and that is right here in Kansas. My mother was born uh, on a farm just a little bit outside of Baser, Kansas, which is close to Tonganoxie, if you don't know Baser. I used to swim in that Tonganoxie pool. I thought it was really fantastic. And, and so this is where I spend time. It's great to be back here. I saw uh, three of my five cousins for lunch today. So happy to be here. 
Good. Well, then I won't have to redirect because I thought you buried the lead there. The fact that your you know, mother was born in Kansas was probably the most important part of your background. Um, what brought you to political reform? So many things. Let's see. I will, I will tell you a story um, that really encapsulates it better than my long uh, explanation. So I have two children. Um, the oldest is 16. The youngest is four. And my oldest, about eight years ago, so probably right about when you and I were meeting, uh, I had her in the car. You know, they're captive in the car. So I said to my eight-year-old, uh, honey, did you know that our national debt is $19 trillion? And she said, really? And I said, yeah. And uh, guess who's going to have to pay that back? <laughs> and, and she said, you? And I said, oh, no, no, you're super cute, but no, not me, you. To which she responded, me? What did I ever do? <laughs> and that illustrates you know, what brings me here today. A couple of things. One, I have a policy that, that's just one of the many policies that I care about, and that one is emblematic of sort of how we're running our country today, that we keep just thinking it's OK to put things you know, on the credit card, and that applies to everybody in Washington, D.C., who's in the business of doing that. And then uh, that I f really felt that I owed it to my daughter to be involved in something when I was looking at her future and saying uh, that it was going to be um, not the future that I had hoped for when I was growing up. And finally, the third reason is because through a confluence of events and, and opportunities, I had come to have a certain view about what was wrong with politics, which I'm sure we're about to talk about. And I really couldn't unsee what I had seen. So you know how sometimes you guys have the feeling that you're called upon for something, like a you're it, like tag you're it? I had a little bit of that experience um, in my engagement in politics. And eventually, as I said, that led to my selling the company to do this. Well, and, and I would say that your experience is not dissimilar from a lot of folks that I've talked to in the political reform space. They generally come to it around an issue that they care about, uh, and then they realize pretty quickly, unless we change our system of politics, we're not going to make progress on any of those issues, whether it's the national debt, our climate, immigration reform. There's a whole range of things uh, where that's, that's a bottleneck. Um, yeah, I think we, we could, in this, in this sort of political innovation circles, we could probably come and wear a name tag that basically says, my, you know, entry issue is, and we would all have a different issue, but end up in the same place at yeah, system. A absolutely. So before we get into that thing that you saw that you couldn't unsee, mm. let's talk a little bit about uh, the book that you wrote in 2020. So you wrote a book. <gasps> Uh, on the politics industry that really sort of married your private sector experience with what you were seeing in the public sector. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about the book and explain really the foundation and the framework for the book and, and how it led you uh, really to view this as a systems problem? Absolutely. So, so there I was, super concerned about politics, but that was sort of something I was thinking over here. And then at the same time, I'm running my business. So I'll put those two pieces together. In 2013, I was working on the classic strategy project, which is essentially, how am I going to sell more cheese on into the future? And it actually was a complicated project. But at the core of it, here's the answer. If my customers like my cheese, they buy more and I do well. If they don't, then they buy from someone else, and I do less well. So it's really a win-win situation. You know, happy customers equals successful businesses, and it's a virtuous cycle. And as I was doing this strategy project, this other part of my brain was thinking about politics, and I was wondering why competition in, in most industries is this win-win uh, cycle, and yet in politics, it seems that the competition, which is really intense, is win-lose. So those in the business of politics are doing very well. The business is bigger than ever. The power in that industry is bigger than ever. At a time when customers, let's call it, voters, citizens, have never been more dissatisfied. So there's a disconnect there. 
And how, and I ask myself, how is it possible that those in the business of politics can do so well when their customers are so unhappy? And that leads to really a system design. It leads away from blaming this particular politician, this particular party, uh, this, anything that happens in this particular election, and leads to saying that there's something going on in the system uh, that is incenting that kind of behavior, that kind of disconnect. And, and you know, one of the things I always point to when I look at that question of how the industry is doing so well uh, is the fact now that the five wealthiest counties in America all ring Washington, D.C. Uh, and there's a reason for that. So you have said in your book, uh, and I think I've heard you say it often uh, in some of the talks that you've given, that Washington isn't broken. Uh, in fact, it's working precisely as it's designed to work. Uh, can you expand on that? Right, this, this goes with what we're just talking about right now. Um, I think it's funny because there's not a lot that perhaps 90% of people in the country agree on politically these days, but one thing they do agree on is that Washington is broken. And yet, paradoxically, it is, in certain sense, the one thing we're all wrong about. Because, as you just said, it isn't broken, per se. It's doing what it's designed to do. The reason we think it's broken is because we've rationally and yet mistakenly assumed that Washington, D.C. has been designed to work to solve problems on behalf of the voters. And yet, it turns out that when we look under the proverbial hood, we see that the Constitution fits in your pocket, right? It's tiny. Most of the rules and practices driving behavior in our politics industry and in Congress, for example, today, they're not in the Constitution. They've been designed over time, optimized, continuously fine-tuned by and for the benefit of those in this business of politics. Private gain-seeking organizations, let's say our two political parties and all of their industry allies in the business of politics. And as we noted, they're doing great while their customers are not doing so great. So Washington DC has a design problem. If we, it's again, the design now is optimized for the benefit of only some, and what we need to do is look at how we would optimize that design for the benefit of the customers. While, let me just say, the business of politics would still do well. And I'll, I'll put this out there. There's nothing wrong with people in the business of politics doing well. As long as they're doing well comes as a result of they're solving problems and creating opportunities on behalf of the American public. It's, so I don't want the business of politics to not go well. And in fact, I support very strong parties. But we want their strength to be related to how well they're serving their customers. And for that, we need to change the design and change the, ins the incentives. It, it reminds me a little bit of a special that John Oliver did at one time on, on uh, uh, gun control in Australia, and he juxtaposed it with what was happening in the United States. And he asked J.B. Manley, who happened to be Harry Reid's chief of staff, what the most important job of a senator was. And J.B.'s response was to get reelected. And uh, of course, John Oliver looked at him with a blank stare, and J.B. said, well, uh, can I change that answer? Can we, can, <laughs> and, and John Oliver said, well, that's what you said. And he said, well, it, it's, it's to, to enact policies that improve the lives of people. But the first natural reaction was to say, it's to get reelected. And I think that's a little bit what you're talking about. So let, let me say one more thing. It is to get reelected. But where I differ with perhaps some conventional wisdom is we don't want to think that politicians should care less about their reelection than any of us care about keeping our jobs and advancing in our jobs, right? Totally fine that they care about getting reelected. Our challenge right now in our system is that essentially, uh, let's think of a Venn diagram. So if we have one circle over here and this is the likelihood that someone's going to get reelected, and this is the circle of, you know, um, they're solving problems in the public interest. 
these two things are not connected. Okay, so actually, what's, what's connected with getting reelected is gridlock, demonizing the other side, grandstanding. That is what helps people get elected in the current system, so that's what they do. And I tell you, you know, I don't know how many of you are in politics, but I, let's just think many people are probably in some private industry or not-for-profit organizations. If we figured out that people that we worked with um, were being incented to do precisely the things that would most hurt our overall success, we would change those incentives so fast. And yet, for some reason, we've come to just accept them in our politics industry as if it could only be that way. Well, and part of the challenge, and this is a discussion we've had often, is the, you know, the fact that changing the rules and the incentives and the politics sort of requires the consent of the victims in some ways, <laughs> right? Those people who are losing power and control in many places have to consent to losing it. Uh, because effectively we've got the fox in charge of the hen house. So, and, and by the way, this is one point of departure that Catherine and I have. She, she sort of thinks good people trapped in a bad system. I think bad people trapped in a bad system, but <laughs> we both agree it's a bad system. So we'll, we'll, we'll I, I do want to say though, Greg, if you want to get the people um, in the system to change the system, you might be more successful if you didn't lead with bad people in bad system, yeah. okay? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and again, I understand your, your point of view there. I just like to be a little bit more direct and authentic. Um, uh, so, uh, nonetheless, um, what's the answer? What's the solution? Yes, there is a solution, actually, which is, um, which is why I sold my company. Because I definitely didn't sell my company to sort of, like, be Don Quixote, you know, at windmills for the rest of my life. I sold my company because the thing I couldn't unsee was the solution. We've all seen the problem, but when the solution, uh, you know, sort of became clear, that was the part that, that caused me to, you know, change what I was doing with my life. So here's what it is. So I told you about that Venn diagram, right? Where right now, solving problems in the public interest is not connected with the likelihood of getting reelected. So the central question is, how can we connect those two things? How can we make it that the best way to get reelected is by solving problems in the public interest? Oh, look, there is a slide. <laughs> yes, how can we get that? OK, I don't know who did that for me, but I like it. Um, all right, so let me step back for just one moment, and, and let's have a little uh, imagination just to play this out. Imagine for a moment that you are a member of Congress, and you are deciding how to vote on a bipartisan, consensus, highly negotiated, landmark piece of legislation on one of those problems you referred to. So the national debt, climate, immigration, infrastructure. The questions as you're deciding your vote that you might want to ask yourself are, is this a good idea? Is this the best? possibility to move you know, forward on this issue at this time. Uh, is this what the majority of my constituents want? But the fact is that right now you wouldn't ask yourself any of those questions. Because the thing you would ask first is, will I win my next party primary if I vote yes on this bill? And if the answer to that question is no, then the answers to any other questions you might want to ask yourself are virtually wholly irrelevant because the rational incentive to get reelected dictates that you vote no. And here's the core. On our complex issues, in all of those areas, they're hard because if they were easy, even in our crummy system, we would solve them, right? They're hard. There are huge trade-offs to be involved. There's no one right, perfect way forward. So every time one of those opportunities comes up, the answer to the question of will I win my next party primary if I vote for this is no on both sides. So think about my issue that I came to this on, debt and deficit. Way back in, uh, in the early years of the Obama administration, there was a Simpson-Bowles uh, deficit commission. It was a bipartisan commission. And they created a recommendation on the front page of their recommendation. They, there's 
like, it's like three quarters of the way down, I can even picture it, they basically say, none of us likes everything in this proposal. But we thought that the sum of it was worth what we had to give up in order to get to this solution. And that's why they uh, moved it forward. But note, that was a commission made up of many former members of Congress. For actual members of Congress who then had to get reelected, that, that recommendation completely died. It went nowhere. So I really am going to answer your question right about now. <laughs> OK, so that's a problem. Here's what we can do to change it. Let's change what it takes to get and keep the jobs, meaning let's change how we elect people. So what I propose is a solution called final five voting. And final five voting is meant to think healthy competition, like final four competition in basketball. <coughs> um, final five voting is the umbrella name for two changes to our elections. The first is, let's eliminate party primaries, which we just invented 100 years ago anyway. Let's eliminate them. And in instead, we will have a first round election called a primary a universal primary where all candidates run, will run on the same ballot regardless of party, independents, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Greens, and all voters will vote on that same slate. So go into the polls on primary day, which here in Kansas and Missouri will be August 3rd. You would see everybody pick your favorite, just like always, polls close. And then after they count the votes, the top five finishers from that universal primary would move forward to the general election. We're not gonna have just one Democrat or one Republican. So now in the general election, we're gonna have a diverse, a, a dynamic competition of visions, candidates, five. If you were in a very Republican district, you could easily have four of those candidates being Republicans saying, I am the best person to put forward this conservative vision, et cetera. So you're having a lot of competition. Then when we go into the general, we need to figure out which of these five wins now that we have real choices. And it's not as easy as we would think, because what we don't want to do is now that we have the benefit of this competition in the general election, we wouldn't want one of those five to sort of accidentally win with 21% of the vote if the vote split five ways, right? We need to find out which of these five has the greatest support from the most number of voters, which brings us to change number two of final five voting. We're gonna eliminate plurality voting where the person with the most votes wins, and we're gonna require the winner to have majority support, over 50%. And to do that, we use instant runoff voting. Very simple, we're, we're sort of used to this in our, mind, in, in our lives. We go into the polls, we see our five choices, and I don't know if the slide people can put up the ballot, but. If magically they can, it would be great. And, uh, but otherwise, I will describe it to you. We see our, our five choices, and you get to rank them. This is my first choice. I absolutely want Greg Orman to be the senator from, well, that's maybe cuts too close to home. Um, anyway, um, I want Greg Orman, nonetheless, to be the senator <laughs> from the state of Kansas, OK? And then, but if I can't have Greg, I will take Sylvie. And if I can't have Sylvie or Greg, then I'll take my third choice all the way down to something like, and you know, my fifth choice, Catherine Gale, over my dead body, do I want her to win, OK? <laughs> you can rank as many or as few as you want. Then, when the polls close, we count up all the first choice votes. And if one of those five candidates has over 50% support, great, it's clear. We know who's going to win but we move into a series of instant runoffs. We eliminate the candidate who came in last, fifth place. They're not gonna win, they're out. If you had selected that candidate, who's now out of the race, then your single vote is now automatically transferred to your next choice, who's still in the race. We run the totals again, and we keep eliminating the candidate in last place until we end with the final two, and then we see uh, who has the true majority, who has uh, over 50 results in the candidate with the broadest appeal to the most number of voters. But the most, and, and so that, that is final five voting. It is the combination of universal top five primaries with instant runoff voting general elections. And, and in terms of 
that instant runoff general election. Where is that in use today? Final five voting, a final five style election used for the first time in Alaska on November 8th of this year. Alaska passed this change by ballot initiative in 2020. So that'll be the first time we have this final four, final five style election. Um, but the instant runoff voting piece of the change is a system that is used around the world in different places like Australia, like um, Ireland. And it has also been more recently uh, adopted in several places in the United States, in certain municipalities, but most famously in the state of Maine, which passed what they call ranked choice voting. I call it instant runoff voting. Ranked choice voting for all of their elections um, back in June of 2018? Actually, they passed it first yeah, in they, November of that's 2016. True. And then, not surprisingly, the Democrats and Republicans got together in Maine and basically refused to implement it, um, effectively repealed it legislatively. It's the one thing they agree on is yeah, right. keeping out competition. So it was a unique moment of bipartisanship in Maine. Um, and then they had what's called a citizen's veto, where they went the ahead people's and gathered, veto. The people's yes. veto, where they went ahead and gathered another almost 60,000 signatures and passed it again in 2018. Yes. So. And, and it was so interesting. I, my daughter, you know, the one that I make think about the national debt when she's eight years old. So at this time, she knew that that was an incredibly important election. And she told me I had to wake her up. So the results came in um, after midnight in Wisconsin, and I honestly did wake my daughter up to tell her that we had won that, uh, that election. So you, you've mentioned that it's been uh, adopted in Alaska in November of 2020. First election is in November of 2022, Correct. this year. Um, but I've also heard you assert at times that it's already having an impact on elected officials. Can you? Explain that a little bit. Yes, good point. So let me step back and say something really important about final five voting, or since Alaska only has a top four, we call it final four voting there. Okay. Final five voting is not designed to necessarily or primarily change who wins. It's designed to change what the winners do do when they're serving, what they have the freedom to do, what they're incented to do, and on whose behalf they're doing it, which would be, in this case, on behalf of general election voters, which is not the case in our elections now. So what we've seen this result in Alaska, which is to say, all those people who were elected in 2020 were elected under the old system, but the same night they were elected, the rules for their next election changed. So as they look forward, their incentives are governed by how they're going to get reelected, even though they're the same people who got elected under the old system. And uh, here's an example of what we've seen in Alaska. So Alaska chose to put final four voting in place for their federal delegation and all of their state offices, so their assembly and Senate. In, I, let's see, I'm not gonna know exactly the month, but. In, no, it is. Early in 2021, Alaska was headed to a, uh, a, like a shutdown, a government shutdown, because they couldn't reach an agreement on their budget. And what we saw happen in Alaska is a coalition came together of Republicans, Democrats, and independents who passed the budget not on party lines, because it was going to fail on party lines. They passed it with a cross-partisan coalition, and therefore were able to avert the shutdown. And the reason that they could do this is, I mean, there are many reasons, but one of the key is that those people who previously believed that they would have lost their party primaries by voting yes for this knew that if they voted yes, they got to make their case to the general electorate. So 
they now had the freedom to vote yes on this bill, and therefore they averted their shutdown and had theoretically a rational budget. And then can I say one other thing that we're seeing in Alaska? So here's, here's where it will probably come to your attention much more, which is the elections that are coming up in this year on November 8th. Uh, there's a Senate election in Alaska, and their current senator, who's, who's up for re-election, Senator Lisa Murkowski, um, will be in that race. Under the old, Senator Murkowski has found herself, or not found, she has intentionally or not, she is not part of Trump's Republican Party, okay? And so he has endorsed a primary challenger, or a challenger, so they don't have a primary anymore, a challenger to Senator Lisa Murkowski. Under the old system, Senator Murkowski would already be finished. We would know right now that she was going to lose her primary. And when that primary happens in the summer in Alaska, that decision would have been made, rendering all those people showing up in you know, November, rendering their votes you know, meaningless, and they wouldn't even have a chance to choose. So what Final, Five, what Final Four voting has done in Alaska is guaranteed that a, a majority of Alaskans will get the opportunity to choose who they want to be their senator. Some reformers think that final four voting only works, is only a success if Senator Lisa Murkowski wins because she's more moderate, shall we say. But I will say to you right now, that's not the case in any way, shape, or form because if a majority of general election voters in Alaska want Kelly Shabaka, who is running to the right of Lisa Murkowski, to be their senator, then that is exactly who they should get, right? That's who any election system should give them. But if they want Senator Lisa Murkowski to be their senator, then they should get to have her. And in this new system, they have the choice of either, plus the choice of the Democrat, and then the fourth person who would be in the race. In the old system, they were not going to have that choice. They were simply not going to have the choice. It, it's probably noteworthy, and I'll share a, an example on the other side though, but Lisa Murkowski is actually the only U.S. Senator who voted to convict President Trump uh, of impeachment, who had a re-election, the only Republican Senator who had a re-election coming in the next cycle. So in some senses you might say it liberated her to do that. Um, others who have pointed to the system that they used in New York City, now New York City choice voting to their Democratic primary for mayor and you know they noted that when Mayor Bill de Blasio got elected he got elected with 21 percent of the vote and you know de Blasio I think was widely considered to be a not a terribly successful mayor notwithstanding the fact that he ran for president apparently that's the definition of the Peter principle right but um, <laughs> but ultimately uh, what what we saw in the case of New York in their election this go around is they ended up electing someone in Eric Adams who was considered to be uh, a more moderate uh, a more moderate mayor so again I know it's not intended to change who gets elected but I think we have seen that so with yeah, that, that in mind, well I think yeah. I want to uh, you and I can debate a few more things here here's I I was not a supporter of moving to ranked choice voting in the New York City primary. And here's why. Because putting what I call instant runoff voting into a party primary can change who wins that party primary. It doesn't change what the winners can do. Not substanti substantively enough to free them to actually do the work in Congress as it needs doing, or in this case, for the mayor of New York. Here's what I mean. So Eric Adams was basically being called Mr. Mayor by the middle of July, but the general election in New York was in November. And in New York, you have to be a registered Democrat to vote in that, what was then the July primary. So when you change it to instant runoff voting, you still make every general election vote worthless because the decision was already made when you show up. And that means all independents, all Republicans, all Democrats who didn't turn out in the party primary have no say. 
Final five voting always ensures that the decision will be made in the general election when everybody shows up. And that's how it frees those who lead out of that system to represent, to work on behalf of general election voters instead of what they really are forced to do right now, which is to work first on behalf of what is about 10% of the population who turns out in the party primary that chooses them. Why, why don't we uh, stop for a minute and take questions either from the live stream or uh, from the audience. Does anybody uh, have a question? Well, we'll, we'll go. go ahead, Mr. Elyashar. Thank you very much. I, I think it's a wonderful format. I think what you're trying to do is spectacular. Questions. You're only going to affect, are you only going to affect the well-educated, well-read, well-informed uh, voters because now they have to follow five voters and their philosophies versus one. Two, you might want to consider taking the R&D off of their names so they have to vote on policies instead of par parties. Three, term limits would probably affect a lot more uh, of what you're trying to accomplish than just a, a uh, tiered election. Okay, Thank and you. I think we'll, we'll have a, a three question limit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So let's try to answer these three though. Okay, so uh, what was the first one? Oh, are we only going to help the educated um, voters? No, so we're gonna help all voters because now we're gonna make all votes matter. So there's no question that having uh, highly engaged voters could be very advantageous for a democracy. There are things that we sort of have no leverage over changing. And the engagement of voters, it, there's not a lever we can push, but let's see how this actually plays out. When, when a voter goes to the polls now in November, they don't need to choose all five. They don't need to rank all five. They can, they can only choose one, but for the first time, it will act, first time in many cases, it will be worth the voters' time to learn about these candidates. Because A, there might be choices they're actually gonna like out of these five, instead of having to choose between the lesser of two evils. B, their vote is gonna actually make a difference as to who wins. So I predict, that A, no voter will be worse off than they are right now, but those who choose will be better off and all voters will be better off because of more choices and because their votes will make a difference. So, um, but there's no like sort of utopian switch where we then also pull to get the engaged voters automatically. This, oh, should we? Yeah, Sybil, that's, uh, that's a very good point. So one of the things that has been debated and in, in voting um, or political innovation circles is whether ranked choice voting can create more civil campaigning. Um, I am on a different side of that than most people. So I don't think that it automatically creates more civil campaigning in final five voting. And here's why, because what we propose in final five voting is that the instant runoff voting be used when, they're, when we're down to five. And then you're going to need to draw you know, clear distinctions. What we will have less of is um, dishonest campaigning because you will have intra-party competition to hold people accountable. Here's what I mean. In a, in a given race right now, if you have a Republican and Democrat, we all sort of think that the Republican is, set, is going to say that the Democrat is awful or lying or did X or did Y, all terrible things, and that the Republican is going to say, the, and the Democrat's going to say those kind of things about the Republican. But now, if we have, as I mentioned before, a Republican district and four of the five are Republicans, they can hold each other accountable within, that, within um, 
you know, sort of their own intra-party competition. So we could have, therefore, more honest campaigning because there's an accountability in the system. But I predict that we will still fight pretty fiercely over um, which, which of these candidates should be the first choice. And I don't think we're going to see a lot of civil campaigning in Alaska because of what's at stake. One last thing. In a race, if you put instant runoff voting in a race of 10 people, you'll absolutely see civil campaigning from those who are like, you know, fourth choice to 10th choice kind of down because they're going to try to get second choice votes of everybody else to move there. Um, to move up, but on the top tiers, you're not likely to hear a lot of uh, civil campaigning, and that's my vote, and we'll have to see how it comes out in, the in practice. You know, I, I think there's a corollary to that as well, which is um, ranked choice voting in some senses also makes independent candidates more viable, because, you know, for those of you who followed some of my races, you realize one of the big arguments was you're spoiling the race. You're, you're going to spoil the race, and I you know, I, I had multiple conversations with people where they'd say, well, if I could pick the candidate, it would be you. But I, I'm so afraid of the Republican that I'm going to vote for the Democrat. Or someone would say, if I could pick the candidate, it'd be you, but I'm so afraid of the Democrat that I'm going to vote for the Republican. And it eliminates that. And so in a system that makes independence, in my mind, more competitive, or a, a third choice, whether it's an independent or a libertarian or a, another Republican, more competitive, it dilutes the value of negative campaigning. Because if I'm going to spend a million dollars attacking Dave, the unintended beneficiary of that is actually not me. It's the third candidate. Because there are a lot of people who say, I don't like negative campaigning, so maybe I don't like what they said about Dave, I'm not going to vote for Dave, but I'm certainly not going to vote for the person who placed that ad. And so either you've got to spend twice as much money on negative campaigning, which they may do, uh, or you've got to present a positive argument for your own candidacy. And, you know, I like to say today we don't vote for candidates we love or who inspire us. We vote against candidates we hate and we fear. Um, and in my mind, that lets politicians off the hook. You don't have to do anything positive. You don't have to improve the lives of your constituents. You just need to make them afraid of your opponent. I, and and while, while we'll limit questions to three, I'll reserve your right to answer only one of them. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, and we'll talk I about I wanted them. to, they're great questions though, so I want so, to answer, okay. answer them if someone else asks them. And can I jump in? Yeah. No surprise people in Kansas are excited when you mentioned Final Four, but our lovely production team is going to vote us out if we don't wait for the microphone because people that are live streaming can't hear the questions. So we will start here. I'm interested to know, uh, it's obviously early, what, that, what this is done, doing to turnout. I'm thinking especially if you took the, the Republican and Democrat off those ballots and forced people to think, it might actually reduce the turnout if they had to, if they had to actually stop and think about it. I'm wondering what, what's happening to turnout so far on these, uh, these kind of initiatives. Yeah, so we don't have, in, we don't have actual statistics on, on turnout because we're going to have the first election in Alaska coming up. I predict it will be greater because it will be worth turning out, and people do tend to want to do things where it's worth their time. I think we have a huge turnout problem because people know that in many, many, many cases when they show up in November, the decision was already made, and it's really fundamentally not worth their time, and they don't see candidates they like. But here's the thing, just to get at a point of your question. We're actually not, and, and back to yours, sir, we're not taking party labels off. Okay, so people will need, let me say this, our founders warned against political parties, but they were warning against this division that we have right now. Um, John Adams famously said, there is nothing which I dread so much as a division of the republic into two great parties, each design, each, um, con opposing each other and concerting measures in opposition to each other, which is really fundamentally where we're at. But as political science has evolved, and this is certainly what I ascribe to, we actually really in a democracy need political parties. What we need are political parties whose success is based on whether they solve problems in the interest of general election voters, not on whether they figure out how to win a low turnout party primary and how to use um, 
you know, sort of special interest money, et cetera, to prevail in that game. So we're going to have those party labels. They'll be able to see them. And this will encourage the parties to conduct themselves in a way to win those races. A way of looking at it is, uh, I totally agree with Greg, this will help independents to run. And we need more independents to run. We need more new parties, et cetera, because what we need is the threat of new competition, because that's what pushes in any human endeavor, that's what pushes innovation and advancement, right, is sort of that threat of new competition. And right now we have a duopoly where nobody else can get in. So a way to think about it, though, is that it's not a problem. The Democrats aren't the problem. The Republicans aren't the problem, per se. But no, I didn't really mean that that way. But, but <laughs> yeah, someone, you could get a room and everybody would have their view about which one of those are the problem. But when you look at it from a systems perspective, it's not this one or that one. And the problem is also not that we have only two parties. The problem is that in the current system, the current two parties are guaranteed to be the only two ongoingly, regardless of what they do or don't get done on behalf of the public. So with this system, if they don't start getting things done to make their customers happy, there will be new independents who have a chance for winning. There will be new parties, and that's how we'll move forward. So before we go to another question, isn't this just a progressive plot to control elections? <laughs> uh, I've been asked that before, but uh, what I've also been asked is, isn't this just a conservative plot? For example, just Saturday night I was at dinner, um, and a gentleman with whom I was discussing this said, you are, this is fantastic, he said, but you are never going to get liberals to, you know, go for this. So it depends on, once you like it, you think the other side isn't going to like it, is what we see. But let me tell you how it works in real life when you spend the time. In Wisconsin, where I'm from, we founded a campaign for Final Five voting back in 2017. And when we had our first big event, there were like 16 of us that were um, announcing that we were going to have this campaign in Wisconsin. We had our 400 closest friends in the ballroom. And two people, um, there, were, uh, there was this duo of, of two who stood up at one point in the evening to talk about why they supported it. And one of them was a man named Andy Nunnemaker. And he stood up and said, you know, hi, I'm Andy. And in case you don't know me, I have, you know, I had a fundraiser for Trump in my home in, you know, 2016. He was the only person in Wisconsin who had that fundraiser. And then the woman right next to him said, and hi, my name is Lined. And if you don't know me, you know, I am a uh, very passionate funder of, of significant uh, progressive causes. And then they proceeded to explain, we don't agree on anything except we agree on this. We agree the system isn't working, and we agree that we need to change these rules of the game for everybody. And in the meantime, we are going to keep raising money for different candidates, voting for different candidates, contributing to different causes, um, you know, feeling differently about every action that's coming out of the government, but we're going to stay united on this. And we see that strange bedfellow aspect whenever people take a look closely at this. The foreword to my book was written by a, jointly by a Republican congressman and a Democratic congressman, both former veterans who basically said in the foreword, why, when we served in the military, out of our love of country and desire for, to serve the public, were we on the same For America team, and now we take our love of country and our desire to serve our fellow Americans to Congress and we're automatically on different teams. It shouldn't have to be that way. And, and our two co-sponsors in Wisconsin, our lead Senate co-sponsor, a conservative Republican, our lead Democratic co-sponsor, a liberal uh, Democrat from Milwaukee, and they're together on this bill. We, there's, there's massive number of bills right now about voting in state legislatures around the country. I think there's 400. And I believe we may be the only bipartisan bill about voting in the entire country. So no, it's not a liberal plot. It's not a conservative plot. It's definitely a for the people plot. Why don't we take a question from the live stream? Thank you. Don asked, and this um, kind of continues 
your story about meeting two individuals that are on opposite ends of the political spectrum. Don asks, he loves the concept, but how do you ever get the RNC and DNC to buy in, especially when you're talking about creating third parties? Two things. First of all, what's amazing about Final Five voting is that it's not just powerful in how it could affect behavior and results out of Congress, but it's actually achievable. So for example, the reason we can't even talk about term limits is because they require a constitutional amendment. So we could argue about whether they're powerful enough, but since we can't do them, we shouldn't spend any time on it. When you look at Final Five voting, it's achievable because in the Constitution, Article I, gives each state individually the power to make all the rules for how people are elected to Congress. So each sta state can change these rules in, uh, individually. About half of the states can change the rules by a citizen referendum, a ballot initiative. So Missouri, for example, some of you are from Missouri, has that option here. Kansas does not. Kansas would have to change these rules through their legislature, through a bill that would pass both houses and the governor would sign, but Missouri could put it to a vote of the people. So Alaska passed it through a vote, through a ballot initiative, and we have two uh, ballot initiatives that will be um, moving forward for 2022 that we're in, one of which is in Missouri. And so uh, the citizens do not need to get the say-so of those that are currently in power. Having said that, I'm gonna tell you, these are great jobs. No layoffs, right? Same number of people in Congress. Who wouldn't want to go to Congress freed up to actually negotiate, cut deals, innovate, reach across the aisle and solve problems and not feel that your hands were tied behind your back because you couldn't take care of all of the people in your district? So, so think forward for me. W mm -hmm. What's the vision? Vision. Interestingly, it doesn't take that many states to make a difference in what Congress delivers on behalf of the American people. Think of it this way. We have won this in Alaska. If we win four more states, which we're on track to do easily, I wouldn't say easily, it's not easy, but we are definitely on track to have four more states, total of five, at, by the end of uh, 2024, which would give us 10 senators who have been freed from the tyranny of the party primary and who also know they're accountable to general election voters and they know that they will f actually face new competition in the general election if they don't get the job done. So put those dynamics into Congress, 10 people in the Senate, if the Senate stays reasonably equally divided, think of those 10 as being essentially a fulcrum in the middle. They don't share the same views, but they, they are ideally suited to sort of sit on a bench off of which could come the gang of four, the gang of eight, the gang of six, to form a consensus-seeking core to address these big issues that we have. Whereas right now, nobody can afford to take that risk, nobody or rarely can people afford to take that risk to serve in those positions. So you can alter the kind of legislation that comes out of Congress with a very few number of states passing these changes. Why don't we take one more question from the audience? Rob, Robert, why don't you wait for the mic? Thank you. The question I have is, is the influence of campaign finance and special interest money, which you related to a moment ago, and the effect of Citizens United allowing the very rich and through super PACs to buy elected officials. So how's the, how is ranked choice voting or final five voting going to affect the allocation of, of those campaign finance funds that are distributed from the RNC and the DNC? Because as, as we have experienced, they typically I hate to use the word rig, but they've chosen who they wish to be the candidate early in the game, and they're going to funnel the funding to them for campaign finance. Mm -hmm. How is that going to be affected? Yeah, so uh, campaign finance often comes up. We're concerned about 
the distorting effect of money in politics. And here's the thing. In the existing system, if we could somehow wave a magic wand and reduce the money in the self-interested money in politics by a factor of 10, but nothing else changed, we would effectively be making it 10 times cheaper for that self-interested money to get the result that they want. Because the challenge that we have that is that money is in politics because it's an extraordinary ROI. People who have money to put into politics are not putting it in because it's a bad investment for what they want. They're putting it in because they think it's a good investment and they're going to get what they want out of it. And it works in large part because, not because there's an absolute money in politics, but because, but because the value of votes in, in our political system, in our democracy, is virtually zero. The value of a general election vote is zero because the decision was made. So if you make an investment in a candidate after the primary, you know what you're going to get. The answer, the best answer, the only one that is possible given our Constitution and Supreme Court rulings and even the way that incentives really turn out, uh, the best answer to the pernicious challenge of money in politics is to make votes more important than money. Because if you can't win, then people aren't going to you know, give you money, and now you'll have to win with the majority of general election uh, votes. And I'll, I want to give you a couple of facts that uh, my team looked up for me today. So if we look at, uh, I'll just combine, I'm sure Missouri and Kansas don't want this, but let's make you one state for a moment and say that you have 12 uh, House seats. And 10 of those House seats are not competitive. Okay, 10 of those House seats are decided in the primary, which means here we've estimated that coming up in 22, you'll have about two and a half million people. Did I even write it down? Maybe I did. I didn't. Two and a half million people are going to show up. No, three and a half million people are going to show up in the general election and vote for those seats. But the decision will have been made by only a million people who showed up in those primaries. But with final five voting, three and a half million votes would have a say. And not just a million votes. And that is really what our democracy should be about. And that's how we really, um, elim not eliminate, how we elevate the power of votes over the power of money. Sylvie, I understand how putting them together might have made the math easier, but it was historically tone deaf. <laughs> That's because I'm not a candidate for anything. I'm just a fellow citizen telling the truth. If I wanted to be a candidate, I'd have to get that all right. Yeah, and sort of to reinforce your value of money argument, you know, the pharmaceutical industry spent $4 billion over the last 20 years lobbying Congress and basically a, a, a lot of campaign cash as well. And the benefit of Medicare being prohibited from negotiating prescription drug prices uh, costs us about a half a trillion dollars over 10 years. So if you think about the return on investment that Catherine was referring to, the return on investment is huge. Um, how can people help? Let me see if I can recover from my tone-deaf response <laughs> and, and come back and appeal very much to those of you from Missouri, because in Missouri, there is uh, a ballot initiative in the works for, in this case, final four voting in Missouri. And so anybody who wants to get involved in helping that campaign uh, should, I don't know, do I get to say my website? Sure. Is that what I get yeah. to do here? Okay. Come on over to my website, which is uh, political-innovation.org. And then you can get in touch with us through there if you'd want to be a part of that campaign. The second thing, sorry? Oh, yes, political-innovation.org. The second thing that I would ask all of you to do is to spread the word about this, because nobody's ever heard of it. Okay, like, they haven't heard of it. And if they hear about it from someone who 
they trust, uh, they're likely to take a look. Eventually, this will be weaponized, and they might start hearing about it. Like, for, let me give you an example. We have two ballot initiatives. One's in Nevada, one's in Missouri. In Missouri, which is a red state, it is being opposed more by Republicans than by Democrats. In Nevada, which is a blue state, it is being opposed more by Democrats than by Republicans. So that also proves that it's not a Trojan horse for either side. But my point is, if you could bring this idea to people so they would understand it as the truly sort of nonpartisan for the people pro-general election voter system that it is, that's helpful. And to do that, if you share my TED Talk, that's great. And if you want to look at my TED Talk, which says in 15 minutes essentially what we've talked about here, you can just put my name in, you know, Catherine Gale, Ted, and you will find it. And that would be great. We actually debated just having Catherine's TED talk up here, but we had, we, we had to sell cocktails, so um, we, we decided to do it for an hour. Well, I, I think that, that's going to wrap it up for this evening. Catherine, thank you so much for coming to Kansas and, and uh, being here with us today. Thank you. Love being in Kansas. so much, Greg and Catherine, for um, what has been an enlightening and uh, engaging conversation. We really, really appreciate uh, the privilege of your time this evening. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to any guests that are with us. If you are a guest here tonight, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, um, but you are here because a friend, a colleague, a family member thought that you would enjoy this conversation. Um, if you did, uh, I am of American Public Square. And as is customary at all of our events, um, if you become a member this evening, um, you not only get a membership for yourself, you get a membership to give away to somebody else. So um, before you leave this evening, if you are interested in becoming a member of American Public Square, I invite you to, to head on over to the table and we can get you all signed up. You may have seen some of my beautiful colleagues modeling some APS t-shirts and you may have seen these little journals if you just can't you know can't live without some APS swag uh, I you are welcome to pick some up tonight on your way out um, for a, a, a minimal suggested donation but uh, you too can model uh, an APS t-shirt of your very own um, if you are on social media I encourage you to like like APS on, on your various social media channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, and as always, make sure that you are receiving our member emails um, because you're going to get the sneak peek of upcoming programs. You're going to get cutting room floor content. You're going to get invitations to special events like this. So make sure that uh, info at American Public Square uh, is in your contacts, in your email. Um, it seems appropriate um, that since this is a cocktails and politics event, that we should raise a glass. Um, but I, I know it's not couth to raise an empty glass. So if you have consumed all of your cocktails, uh, don't raise an empty glass, but maybe just raise your hand in the air. Um, but I will leave us this evening with a toast to civility, facts, perspective, and Catherine. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. <laughs> and thank you to American Public Square. It's been so great to be with you.